In a recent Zoom session, we looked at this problem from the textbook. It has to do with the sugar in Krispy Kreme glazed donuts, which is 10 grams per donut, and the fact that people felt that it might be healthier for children to eat children's cereal, and so they compared the sugar content in those two issues. So all we want to do is to do a hypothesis test to determine if there is enough evidence to show that the mean amount of sugar in children's cereal is more than in glazed donuts, and we want to test at the 5% level. Catherine Kosak gives a six-step process for completing a hypothesis test. The first one is to state the random variable and the parameter in words. So in this particular case, our random variable is the amount of sugar in a children's cereal. Uh, the parameter that we're looking at is the average amount of cereal, uh, the av average amount of sugar in a serving of children's cereal. Uh, we need to state the null and the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is always the research uh, question. In, in our problem, the research question is there enough evidence to show that the mean amount of sugar in children's cereal is more than in glazed donuts? There are two kinds of problems that we look at in chapter 7. One has a random variable that's a categorical variable with only one category, and, and well, essentially two categories. Either you have this property or you don't, so it's a binomial distribution. And the second kind of problem is where we're measuring something and our distribution has a mean and a standard deviation. So in our case, we know that we've got the second kind of problem where we've got a distribution that's a continuous probability distribution with a mean and a standard deviation. So we're worried about uh, stating the random variable, which is going to clue us in to what we need to do in this hypothesis test. We've stated the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, and the significance level. I'm going to ask you in your reports to draw a three distribution diagram of the problem. So let's look at the problem one more time. We've got this data, which is the number of grams of sugar in a sample of a children's cereal. And we've got this null and alternative hypothesis that we're trying to, to research. So this problem is looking at a random variable, we'll call it x, that is measuring the number of grams of sugar in a serving of children's cereal. The population parameter that we're looking at is what the mean is of that random variable. That random variable will also have a standard deviation. We've already identified what the null and the alternative hypotheses are. The null hypothesis says that the average number of grams is 10, the same as a glazed donut. The alternative hypothesis says that it's greater than 10. Now, some assumptions here are that, that this is possibly normally distributed. We can kind of check that assumption and see if there's any evidence for that. And what we're going to look at is this second distribution, which is the distribution of those sample means. Now, under the right assumptions, this distribution will be normally distributed the mean of all of these sample means, see we're thinking about every single sample the same size as the sample that we took. And if we looked at every one of those samples and calculated the mean for each of them, then, this, uh, uh, then that distribution of sample means is what we're looking at here. And the mean of those sample means by the central limit theorem is going to be the same as whatever this mean is. The standard deviation of those sample means is going to be this standard deviation divided by the square root of n. You assume that the null hypothesis is true. You see what happens 
with our sample and see if it's unusual under the condition that, we're, that uh, the null hypothesis is true. If that's very unusual for what happens with our sample to have occurred, if the null hypothesis is true, then we'll reject the null hypothesis. That's giving evidence that the alternative hypothesis is true. On the other hand, if it's not unusual, then, uh, then we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis. And we don't have evidence that uh, the alternative hypothesis is true in a significant way. So we're going to assume that this is true. That means that this mean is going to be tan. That means that the mean of the distribution of sample means will also be tan. Our problem is that we don't know this standard deviation, and that's often the case when we're looking at this situation. So what we're going to do is approximate this value with the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n. Those are two of the three distributions that we're looking at. Now, the third distribution is either going to be a T distribution or a Z distribution. And here's how you decide which it's going to be. If this standard deviation is known, then you'll use a Z distribution. If this standard deviation is unknown, and we're having to use this approximation, then that means that uh, we will use a T distribution to adjust for this approximation. So the third distribution in the three distribution diagram is going to be a T distribution. A T distribution is much like a Z distribution. It has a, mu, a, a mean that's equal to zero. It has a standard deviation. Instead of being equal to one, where, which is the case with the Z distribution, it's going to be, have a standard deviation that is bigger than one. The degree of freedom in this chapter is always going to be n minus 1. Okay, now here's what happens. We take a sample from here of a particular size n. We get some value over here, and we find the average of that sample that we took. So that gives us an x bar. That value is called the sample statistic. And we're going to take that sample statistic and convert it to either a T value or a Z value, depending on what kind of a test that we're doing. Uh, that conversion is always the same way. We want to count how many standard deviations this value is away from the mean. So we're going to see how far away it is from the mean by taking the X bar the sample statistic, whatever it is, minus the mean of this distribution, which is really the same as this mean, and then divide it by this standard deviation. Now the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means is called the standard error. So to, to keep it separated from the standard deviation that we had here or other standard deviations we might be referring to, We'll always call it the standard error. <coughs> and now we'll calculate the probability of, of this occurring under the conditions that the null hypothesis is true by calculating the probability down here in the T or the Z distribution. Because we're saying that because the alternative hypothesis is saying that mu is greater than 10, we want an upper tail. So we want to find this area that's above that T value that we calculated here. Of course, that's looking for the same information as finding this area above this X bar adjusted for the fact that we had to approximate this standard deviation here, uh, the, this standard deviation with the standard deviation of the population. So this is a T here, that's the, that value, that T value is called the test statistic. So now we've got our three distribution diagram and we can write our script. 
So I'm going to go to our studio now. So we identified that the null hypothesis was that mu is equal to 10, the number of grams of sugar in a Krispy Kreme donut, and uh, the, the alternative hypothesis is that the average, the mean of the sugar in a serving from a children's cereal is greater than 10, and we're going to test at the alpha level of 5%. Now the information that we're given is this information, this sample. We need to be able to copy that sample. So I'm going to highlight that sample and copy it. I need to get it into some text editor because I need to, to enter this into R as a vector. What I did was highlight that. Uh, I copied that amount. Now I'm going to my text editor. On a pretty simple text editor, you don't. So I pasted that data in. Now, what I'd like to do is put commas in between all of these. I could go along and do that by hand, just putting in commas. I could also do this in the script editor for R. But uh, what I'm going to do is this I'm going to highlight that space in between those, and I'm going to see if I can't find a find and replace. So it's, because I already had it highlighted, it found what was in that highlight. And what I want to do is put a comma and a space everywhere that there was a space between two numbers. So let's replace all. Ah, great. That put a lot of the commas in. All that I need is a comma here and a comma at the end of that line. And then this is munged quite nicely. Copy it and paste it into my R script. So there's my R script and I'm going to uh, paste that amount that I put in there. I need to make this a variable. I'm going to save it in an object called X. I need to have the function C at the start of that and I need to end all of that with the parentheses and I think that I've taken that raw data now, ooh, somehow I lost the commas here. I need a comma after that one, and a comma after that one, and there we go. Okay, so I've got it built correctly. I've got my, my object X, and I'm storing in that something that I'm building a vector using the cantonate function, uh, 10 comma 14 comma until we got all of those in. Follow along in our three distribution diagram. We've, we've built the sample X. I need to know how many elements are in that sample. Now this is a pretty small sample, so I could count those by hand. But notice that we can find that N easily by asking R to count those for us. We need to just say N is equal to the length of that vector X. That'll tell us what uh, the size of the sample is. So now we've identified what the size of the sample is. I'm going to need to know the mean of that sample, and I'm going to need to know the standard deviation of that sample. In my script, I'm going to call that sample mean x bar, which can be found as the mean of x. I want to find the standard deviation of that sample. S is the regular way of the regular symbol used for the standard deviation of a sample, so I'm going to call that S, and I know how to find that. It's just the SD of whatever X is. It's, it's always good to do some annotation in your script. Uh, it doesn't matter to R that that's there. That's just to help you or a reader identify what's happening in your script. So now in my three distribution diagram, I've, I've taken the given information here. I've found out what N is because I looked at that sample and decided how many there, items there were in that sample. So I know what S is, I know what N is, I'll be able to find out what SE is. Then with SE, I'll remember in this formula that T is going to be X minus mu divided by SE standard error of this distribution. 
So now I can, can complete much of the rest of that uh, script. So SE is just S divided by the square root of N. That's the standard deviation of the sample means, or at least our approximation for that. Now to find out what uh, t is, I'm going to need to know what the mean is. I know that the mean is 10. I really should have put that much earlier in my discussion because it's really uh, given information. So I'm going to edit my script. So I've come up here and put in a, a line right after I identified what the null and alternative hypotheses are then assuming that the null hypothesis is true, then mu is going to be 10. So I can find out what t is because I can just measure how many standard deviations it is away from the mean of the distribution that it's in. So it's going to be x bar minus mu divided by se. t is going to be x bar, x bar minus mu how far is x bar away from mu, uh, parentheses, and all of that divided by uh, the standard error of that distribution. So that's measuring how far x, how many standard deviations uh, x bar is away from the mean of that distribution. That value is called the test statistic. Now notice that there is a difference between the sample statistic, did we ever define what the sample statistic was? Uh, X bar is the, is the sample mean, it's the sample also called the sample statistic. So we'll be able to do that calculation. We know this t value, we need to find the upper tail because the null hypothesis is saying that I want to be greater than. So it's the upper tail that we're looking at. We know how to find the area of an upper tail. If we use the P T, because that's the kind of distribution we have here, it's not P norm and it's not P binome, it's a T distribution, so we'll use a P T function in R will tell us this area that's below this area right here, and that's the wrong answer. That's what P T would be. P T of this test statistic t with the degree of freedom that we're interested in would tell us that red area. That's the wrong area. We want the, the upper tail. Okay, so there we are. We calculated the p-value, which is slightly more than 5%. That means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. It's not particularly unusual for a sample to have turned up being that much under the assumption that it's uh, the mean of the population that we were sampling from was equal to 10.